Hi, my name is Jared and this is Horror Obsession. Today, I want to talk about Bones and All, a 2022 horror romance directed by Luca Guadagnino and based on the book of the same name. Bones and All follows in the footsteps of such horror romance films as Let the Right One In, but instead of using the vampire subgenre, they decide to go with cannibals. The end result is basically vampires in sunlight, and I'll explain what I mean. Bones and All follows Marin, a young woman who learns she is something called a vampire. Eater which is a person except they have to eat human flesh to sustain themselves. Her father, fed up with her compulsive eating of people, leaves her to fend for herself and she goes on a journey across rural America in search of her birth mother. Along the way, she discovers other vampires, eaters, that are living on the fringes of society, but will Marin's adventure end with self-discovery or self-destruction? Before we get into spoilers, Bones and All is pretty good. I didn't love it during my actual viewing, but it is very beautifully shot, well acted, and has an interesting but kind of derivative premise. There are about as many twists and turns in this movie as a Montana highway, and like a Montana highway, you can see everything coming from miles away. Despite this, the movie is still engaging at times and uses striking visuals to engage the viewer enough to be a recommend for me. Check this movie out if you're looking for something to watch, it was pretty good. Now let's go through a summary of the movie and discuss the central philosophical conflict. Bones and All takes the most obvious philosophical conflict from vampire movies and changes it to Eaters, which is the moral dilemma of needing to kill other humans to survive. On the one side of this philosophical conflict is Marin, who thinks killing people to survive is bad, and in the middle is Sully, who is kind of indifferent and kills people who are dying anyway, and on the far end is Lee, who hates society so much he is fine with killing. These characters and their actions end up serving as external representations of the internal conflict of Marin, which sounds really intriguing, but unfortunately has been done a million times before in basically every vampire movie. In Let the Right One In, Ellie represents the indifference to human life, while Oscar represents the trepidation towards killing to sustain oneself. The conclusion of that movie is Oscar deciding he kind of hates people and doesn't mind killing, in sharp contrast to Bones and All, which takes the less subversive stance that killing people is probably bad, as demonstrated by Marin and Lee trying to live a normal life at the end. The same philosophical conflict is present in Lost Boys, with Michael representing the character hesitant about killing and David as the one fine with it. In Near Dark, Caleb is hesitant about killing and May is okay with it. Honestly, this particular philosophical conflict is so common it practically defines the vampire romance subgenre. And the primary change with Bones and All is that the eaters can be around in the sunlight. This is definitely a change, but it doesn't really alter the story in any material way other than having scenes during the day. The main characters are still loners, abandoned by society, and left to fend for themselves. They are still living on the fringes of society, trying to scrape together a meaningful existence in a lonely world. And of course, the two main characters fall in love with each other. The journey of the characters is going to present both sides of the argument, and as is tradition, they start with the idea that killing for survival is justified. Sully, played by Mark Rylance and dressed like a hippie fisherman, smells Marin from a mile away because vampires eaters develop a kind of supernatural sense of smell over time, and right away we see how Sully operates. He uses the sense of smell to sniff out a dying woman, breaks into her house, and then eats her. This is the middle ground, where he only kills people who would die anyway, but the dry and monotonous nature of the experience turns Marin off and she leaves. She then runs into Lee, who will embody the more extreme position that killing people to survive is fine, a good foil for Marin. The setup is familiar, but the execution is pretty good. Timothy Chalamet turns in a memorable performance and elevates the character of Lee, and I haven't talked about her yet, but Taylor Russell does an admirable job as his counterpart. The combination of those two and Mark Rylance as Sully pretty much define the entire film, and without such wonderful performances, the movie would be pretty dull. Michael Stolbarge steals the show in his one scene as Kentucky Hillbilly Jake, in a scene which apparently was not in the book, but gives meaning to the title of the book and film, Bones and All. Oh, also, fun horror trivia, the non-eater hillbilly in that scene, Brad, is played by David Gordon Green, who directed the new Halloween trilogy. The scene with Jake and Brad is also important as it is the turning point in the philosophical conflict. You see, Brad is not an eater, but partakes in the cannibalism anyway. Marin and Lee had begun to accept the killing of people for survival, 
but seeing their actions in the context of someone who was just doing it for fun sours them on the whole idea. Jarred by the experience of meeting someone cannibalizing for fun, they go to a carnival to cruise for another victim, but alas, after they murder and eat him, they go to his home address and discover the man had a wife and kids. They comfort themselves by repeatedly stating they didn't know, but the man having a family shoves his humanity into their faces in the way they can't ignore. We don't have to get into the fact that a man's life has no value in their eyes until he is shown to have a family, a destructive and common societal view. Marin and Lee split up for a bit before predictably coming back together, but while she is away, Marin finds her birth mother who checked herself into an insane asylum and chewed off her own hands so as to not live as a monster that needs to kill people to survive. Marin's mom left her a letter, which ends with her saying she's gonna try and kill Marin to prevent her from killing people, and Marin is like, damn girl, you crazy, and pieces out. Marin gets back together with Lee, and they decide killing isn't really their cup of tea, and decide to get normal jobs and live together in an apartment doing normal people stuff. Sully comes back to try to eat Marin, but Lee gets home just in time to save her. Tragically, in the ensuing struggle, Lee gets stabbed in the heart and dies in Marin's arms. His last wish is for Marin to eat him, bones and all, so he can be a part of her forever. The end. The major flaw with bones and all is it takes the most common philosophical conflict from vampire movies and waters it down even further. With vampires, the movie asks the question of whether you would kill people to survive, at the cost of your own humanity, or let yourself wither away and die. Bones and all instead asks the question, what if, instead of having to kill people, they could instead choose not to kill people with almost no consequence? Uh, okay, I see where you're coming from, but that feels like a much less compelling version of the same question. The fact that they can choose at any time to reject the eater lifestyle and live in an apartment, working normal jobs, being in the sun, and doing everything normal people do kind of makes Marin's mom eating her own hands seem a bit... dramatic? Bones and All isn't even my favorite indie film focusing on a female protagonist who has a disease that makes her compulsively eat people. That would be the amazing French film Raw. If you haven't seen it, check that movie out. It is so, so good. Bones and All borrows a lot of elements from other movies and combines them into something kind of new, but doesn't really use the new elements in a different way than the movies it borrows from. The performances are unique, of course, and they single-handedly make this movie worth watching, but 130 minutes of screen time for a familiar and predictable story just so you can see some good performances is a bit tiresome at times. I can see why this movie bombed at the box office, and that's coming from someone with a voracious horror obsession.